Well, I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for having me this Monday of Holy Week. The Holy Week, of course, marks the end of our Lenten journey as we prepare for Easter. I hope that if you have been practicing a spiritual discipline for Lent that you have failed by now. If you haven't, there's still time, don't worry. <laughs> I hope that you failed in part because, well, it'll make me feel better about my own failure. <laughs> but also because Lent is about failure, really. It's about the failure of the world to recognize Jesus for who he was. It's about the failure of the disciples to be able to stay with him. Sometimes we need to learn how to fail. Without failure, there's no need for grace. And there's beauty in grace. Amen. So I'm here to talk to you about corpus. It's the sculpture I was commissioned to make for the Bible and Theology Department. It's a work that lends itself to a Lenten meditation, and I hope it may serve you in that capacity. But I also hope you may see it as a meditation on Easter and beyond. I will try to unpack this in a minute, but first I want to express some of my concerns. First and foremost, I find this all, frankly, terrifying. I am neither predisposed nor particularly well-trained for this kind of public speaking. If anything, most of my academic training has been designed to make my mind work in a nonlinear way that goes against the grain of public speaking. For a sculptor, the mantra for public discourse can be summed up cheekily by William Carlos Williams, no ideas but in things. My colleague and good friend, Dr. Langan, sent me the, an encouraging email this weekend with public speaking tips. Oh, come on. There we go. I made a picture. Thesis. Keep bringing everything back to a clear thesis. One main idea that you actually need to say, not allude to. And then three to five main ideas, no more. That is my public speaking course, short course for you. Well, that's nice. <laughs> but this is my mind map of my talk for today. So here's my thesis. I have no thesis. <laughs> and I can't promise three to five main ideas. This is going to be more like a verbal collage, but at least there will be pictures. <laughs> my second concern is this. More than I want you to know about corpus, I want you to recognize the bigger story of visual theology represented by the rest of the art on the fifth floor of the BGC. In particular, I want to emphasize the way Corpus is in dialogue with the work of two of my colleagues, Professor Sheesley's O Magnum Mysterium and Professor Schreck's Via Dolorosa. The three works together, and even the way the works relate to each other in the space, tell a much richer and complete story of the majesty and mystery of God than any one of them can on their own. And third, I'm very weary of explaining Corpus. This is a true story. A few months after Corpus was installed, I was in a small church basement in Eagle River, Wisconsin on a Sunday afternoon. I was having post-service coffee and meeting some of the parishioners. I introduced myself to a sweet-looking retired couple. The conversation went something like this. Hi, my name is David Hooker. Oh, are you here from Wheaton, said the wife. Yes, I'm here teaching a class at Honey Rock. Are you the infamous David Hooker? Asked the husband. I thought this was a joke, some kind of icebreaker. So I smiled and said, well, I don't know about infamous. <laughs> well, I don't like your sculpture. <laughs> then I understood. He must have read one of the negative reviews about Corpus that was printed online. I was surprised and slightly taken aback. I'd never had a complete stranger confront me on a work of my art before. Clearly, he had some pretty strong feelings because he remembered my name. All I could think of in that moment was how much I wanted that couple to like me. So I explained Corpus in detail, and they proved to be good listeners. 
Sorry. Oh, I like it better now that you've explained it, said the husband. I almost felt relief, except that I realized in that moment I made a serious error. I explained the piece. That is to say, I completely took away its voice, its power to communicate. There was no reason anymore for the couple to actually go and see Corpus. Why would they? Even if they did, there'd be little hope of them having an authentic encounter with the work. They'd only experience it as I had told them to experience it. You see the problem? When an artist explains their work, it is ultimately a disservice to the artist, to the viewer, and most importantly, to the work itself. The artist strives for the artwork to have presence, to have its own voice, that it may say things to the viewer beyond what the artist intended. This is both an invitation to you, the viewer, and a responsibility. Your input matters. Your experience matters. Your relationship to the work matters. So while I'm going to give you a share of, of some of my thoughts about the piece, please don't think of them as definitive. To start, let me say that my prime motivation for making Corpus was not to make some kind of a statement, but to explore a set of ideas through materials. I strongly believe in art as a way of knowing, contrasted with the popular notion that art is a way of communicating. The artwork does communicate, but the process of getting there is more exploration than dictation. In other words, I don't make art because I have something to say, but because I have questions to ask. My approach to art is like a science experiment with an impossible to prove hypothesis about the nature of beauty. I approach making corpus pretty much the same way I do everything else. I tried to make something beautiful out of things that I think are beautiful with a process that I find beautiful. Wow, I'm on time. <laughs> now, I suspect vacuum debris is not a material that comes to immediately to your mind when you hear the word beautiful. Fair enough. But the word beauty is a loaded term. We tend to think we all know what we mean when we say something is beautiful. And we tend to think that everyone ha thinks the same thing when they hear the word. We tend to think beauty is obvious, something we know when we see it. But this is grossly inaccurate. A simple survey of the artwork of different cultures is enough to show us that. Here's a quick example. If I were to poll you and ask you what is the most beautiful artwork in the world, you would most likely pick something made by a person whose name you might also associate with a Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtle. <laughs> These two, by the way, are the most, like, most often chosen. They are ubiquitous, they are famous, and they are beautiful, no mistake. But they also speak to a cultural definition of beauty that is not universal. In Japan, for example, if you ask the same question, you might get this. This is the Kazeyaman tea bowl, considered the finest tea bowl in the world. It is a Japanese national treasure, literally, national treasure. Surprised? Japanese culture has long cultivated a different sense of beauty than the West, one that celebrates irregularity, simplicity, and humility, rather than symmetry, complexity, and ambition. Interestingly enough, the sensibility started at the same time as the Italian Renaissance, which is to say, at the same time in the West, we began to cultivate the sensitivity that gave us Leonardo's Mona Lisa, and continues to dominate our culture today. The Japanese sense of beauty is defined by the term wabi, a word for which there is no equivalent in any Western language. To give you a small understanding of wabi, listen to the writing of Yanagi Soetsu, founder of the Minge folk craft movement and writer of The Unknown Craftsman. This is gonna be a long quote. For a long time, I wished to see this Kaiseyaman bowl. I had expected to see that essence of tea, the seeing eye of tea masters, and to test my own perception. 
For it is the embodiment in miniature of beauty, of the love of beauty, of the philosophy of beauty, and of the relationship of beauty and life. When I saw it, my heart fell. A good tea bowl, yes, but how ordinary. So simple. No more ordinary thing could be imagined. There is not a trace of ornament, not a trace of calculation. It is just a Korean food bowl, a bowl. Moreover, that of a poor man and something he would use every day, commonest crockery. A typical thing for his use, costing next to nothing, made by a poor man, an article without the flavor of personality, used carelessly by its owner, bought without pride, something anyone could have bought anywhere and everywhere. That's the nature of this bowl. The clay has been dug from a hill at the back of the house. The glaze was made with the ash from the hearth. The potter's wheel had been irregular. The shape revealed no particular thought. It was one of many. The work had been done fast. The turning was rough, done with 30 hands. The throwing slipshod. The glaze had run over the foot. The throwing room had been dark. The thrower could not read. The kiln was a wretched affair. The firing careless. Sand got stuck in the pot, but nobody minded. No one invested a thing within the thing with any dreams. It is enough to make one giving up working as a potter. But that is how it should be. The plain and unagitated, the uncalculated, the harmless, the straightforward, the natural, the innocent, the humble, the modest. Where does beauty lie if not in these qualities? The meek, the austere, the unornate, they are the natural characteristics that gain man's affection and respect. Do you hear a whisper of Christian virtues in the eventual embrace of the object? While I was working on my MFA in pottery, I was heavily influenced by the Wabi aesthetic. It wasn't so much an intellectual attraction as that it felt right. And in many ways, I still try to find a way to bring that aesthetic into my work. And it shows up in corpus in, the way, uh, in a way, I think, in the materials that I used. I think there is real wisdom in Wabi, a wisdom we need to hear in the West. And here's the good news. You can learn to appreciate it. That is to say, you can expand your notion of beauty. Whoops, lost my place. <laughs> and here's even more good news. By, uh, by learning to appreciate it, you will not only see your world expand, you will find it easier to love Japanese culture and by extension, the people of that culture. Okay, I just found my thesis. It is this. Beauty is the prerequisite of love. If you want to love your neighbor, learn how to share in their sense of beauty. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's simple, but it's radical. By cultivating a greater sense of beauty, you will learn what it means to see the world as God sees it and to fulfill God's will. Fulfill God's will. Does that seem too extreme? Thomas Merton, tra Trappist monk, mystic and writer, put it this way. If you want to know what is meant by God's will in one's life, this is a way to get a good idea of it. God's will is certainly found in anything that is required of us in order that we may be united with one another in love. I must learn to share with others their joys, their sufferings, their ideas, their needs, their desires, and I would add their beauty. I must learn to do this not only in the cases of those who are the same class, the same profession, the same race, and the same nation as myself, but when people who suffer belong to other groups, even to groups that are regarded as hostile. If I do this, I obey God. If I refuse to do it, I disobey him. For Christianity is not merely a doctrine or a system of beliefs. 
It is Christ living in us and uniting us to one another in his own life and unity. I find an echo of the Wabi aesthetic in the West in a rather unexpected place. Martin Luther's Heidelberg Disputation, Thesis 28. Okay, that is a weird leap. Even for me, that's a weird leap. The Disputation, although less well known than his 95 Thesis, is nonetheless considered one of his seminal works, as in it he puts forth his theology of the cross which he contrasts with a theology of glory. Thesis 28, the final thesis of the document, reads as follows. The love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. Now, if you're like me, when you read that for the first time, you almost understood it. I admit I'm not very good at systematic theology. But what is said here is pretty powerful. There is both an observation and a revelation. Let's flip this around and translate it. Humans love things that are lovely. That is to say, the loveliness of the object creates the love in us. That's an observation. But God, in contrast, loves things that are unlovely and through his love makes them lovely. Boom. <laughs> God transforms things by loving them. Take a second to absorb that. If we take seriously our calling to be co-creators with God, made in the image of God, what does this th thesis say to the way we should approach the world? Even more so, I wonder what it might say to me as an artist of faith, how I see the world, how I understand beauty. Oops. I hope you may be beginning to see now how I th might think about vacuum debris as more than filth. I have another personal story that is also relevant. Confession time. When I was in college, I spent the better part of a summer selling vacuum cleaners door to door. I wasn't very good at it. And eventually I gave up, not having sold a single vacuum. Eventually, uh, anyway, anyway. <laughs> it was my job to try to sweet talk my way into somebody's house, vacuum a portion of the rug, and show the owners how much dirt I could get out of it holding it out for them to see on a little white linen cloth. Of course, they were supposed to be startled by it, but I have to admit I found it fascinating. It was oddly beautiful. The dust and the fibers told a story about place, about objects, about the people who lived in that place. When I was in training, a veteran salesman I was paired with convinced a prospective buyer to let him vacuum their mattress. When he was done, he pulled out the little white linen cloth and it had a small collection of something pale yellow and translucent in the middle of it. Skin cells, he announced. Naturally, the customer was supposed to be disgusted by the revelation, and I think she was. But it was a kind of epiphany for me. I went home and tried it on my own bed. It was amazing for me to think about how we leave little physical bits of ourselves in places we inhabit. I guess I stored that little piece of information in my memory somewhere. When I was asked to make a piece about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the college, that experience came back to me. I realized that the vacuum debris could serve a dual purpose. It could be both a metaphor for our sins and it could represent the way we as a community are grafted to the body of Christ. Two verses became inspirations for the peace. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. And 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. Still, I wasn't sure how to collect the debris. Should I just bring a vacuum and go to town? 
I called Paul Dillon, head of custodial, and told him my idea, and I suspect Paul's never gotten a more unusual phone call. <laughs> Hi, Paul, this is David Hooker from the art department. Will you collect bags of vacuum dirt for me? It's for an artwork. One of the best things about my art practice is that I get to make crazy phone calls like that all the time. <laughs> I wasn't sure what kind of response I'd get, but Paul was immediately on board. It was great. He got 11 vacuum bags for me. He even made sure to get them from different places from all over campus. That is to say, he added something to the concept beyond my, beyond my own imagining. In that way, he and by extension the rest of the custodial staff became collaborators in the making of Corpus, and I find that very gratifying. For the body of itself, I knew instinctively that I wanted to use an existing Corpus or body of Christ from a crucifix that had once been used in a church. The reason was simple. I wanted the history. It is not enough that we see ourselves as unified in this place and time, but we also need to see ourselves as part of the larger body of Christ, extending well beyond Wheaton, standing with faithful witnesses all the way back to the very beginnings of the early church, communing with the saints. There is no better way I can think of to do that than to use something historical. That is why I didn't make a corpus. You can't fake history. Okay, now I'm late. When I finally got both the collected debris and the corpus together, there was still a great deal of revelation for me in the making of the piece. It was lent when I was working on it, and that was certainly appropriate. The process took on a kind of ritual ac action. The vacuum debris had been applied in layers to make it adhere properly. For each layer, I coated part of the figure with acrylic gel medium using a paintbrush, then applied dirt with the gel when the gel was wet. Most of the time, that involved putting handfuls of fibrous dirt into a flour sifter and sifting out the finer particles directly onto the figure. Each layer had to dry overnight. Then the next day, I used a dry brush to sweep away the dirt that wasn't stuck and started another layer. It took five layers to complete the piece, and each layer took two full days. I've been working with processes that are long and ritualistic for some time now, as I hope they will give me a chance to understand the material in a way that is bodily, not just mental. Working on Corpus gave me a number of moments that were powerful and draining emotionally, physically, and spiritually. I'd like to share with you two such moments, as they might not be evident otherwise. The first is when I saw the arms. If you look at the arms, you'll notice there's these gray streaks running down them. Before I got started covering it, I thought, maybe I should clean those off, and then I realized what they were. It's carbon. It's carbon from candles, candles that were placed at the foot of the cross. They're physical manifestations of prayer. Seeing that was powerful. And then I didn't know what to do. Could I still cover them? I had to think about that for a while. Ultimately, I did cover them. I thought it was the right thing to do. Those prayers are still there, even though you can't see them. Prayer is like that sometimes. Prayers also build on themselves, layer after layer, generation after generation. I'm so glad those prayers are part of the peace and the connection to the communion of saints. Another powerful moment when I was came when I was applying the debris to Jesus' feet. I was halfway through when it suddenly dawned on me that parallel between what I was doing and when Mary, brother of Lazarus, came and anointed Jesus' feet with oil. I became instantly aware of how my actions were both like her actions and at the same time the complete opposite of her actions. My hands started to shake. That's never happened to me, even when I worked for a museum and had to handle multi-million dollar artwork. I had to step back, sit down, and just, well, sit with that. I needed time, not to come to some rational understanding of what I was doing, but just to let it sink in bodily. It may surprise you to know that Corpus still continues to reveal itself to me in new ways. 
Sorry, I'm skipping. Skipping. Thank you. Um, while, whoops. <laughs> while during making the piece, I felt more of the Lenten side of the corpus. That is to say, it was reminis the reminiscence of our sin and Christ's sacrifice for those sins. But over time, I'm becoming more and more aware of the piece, the way this piece speaks of the Easter side of the equation. Some of this is hinted at by removing the cross and having the corpus seem to float in midair, which I was hoping would feel more like a lifting up than a weighing down. But I'm also more aware of the organic material and the debris, the skin cells and the hair, the metaphorical compost, fertilizer added to the soil to feed the next generation. In that way, corpus also reminds me of John 17, 23. My prayer is not for the disciples alone, Jesus says. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you and I, you are in me and I am in you. Soon the string quartet will come and play Arvo, uh, excuse me, duet, will play Arvo Peretz Spiegel im Spiegel. As we listen, I would ask us all to consider the ways in which it is both beautiful and surprising. Beauty is not the same as pretty. As Christians, we should understand this most of all. Any way of defining beauty we come up with that it does not include the ugliness of the cross of Christ is insufficient. Beauty is often paradoxical like that. It is sometimes shocking. It has to be if beauty is to be transcendent. Beauty gives you new eyes to see. Beauty bridge, builds bridges and breaks down barriers. Beauty is the prerequisite of love. So I want to leave you with an exhortation. Go forth, pursue beauty, dare to get it wrong, learn to be vulnerable, learn to live with raw nerve endings, learn to feel everything, to be sensitive to every shift of the breeze, every nuance in the light, and may God, the creator of all beauty, shine his face upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.